Hi. Hey. Hey, good evening. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excited to be on here. Me too. And I'm so excited that you came on right away. So I don't have to think of what to talk about. <laughs> yeah, you were asking everyone how their evening is. Mm hmm. This was pretty simple, like coming onto the live. I know. It's pretty good, right? Yeah, this is pretty great. Um, I'm so excited. We've been talking about this for a while, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my schedule was a little funny, but I'm happy that we're making this happen. So, oh, thanks so much. Yeah. I'm so excited. I've heard only incredible things. So I can't wait to hear all of the incredible things we have to say. Okay. I'm excited <laughs> for us to share incredible thoughts. You know, it's like the creation of really like sometimes you'll have a conversation and you're creating something um, together. So, um, and I'm really just grateful for you and your friend or partner, whoever, partner in crime. Shauna. Yeah. Yeah. What well, you're creating really for the community. I'm just like, when I look at your information, I'm like, wow, amazing. So oh, thank you. It's really yeah. collaborative with everybody who, it really is a community effort and we really rely on everybody kind of like sharing things with us and tagging us. And yeah. So it's, it's a very special initiative because it's just really all about like working together. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. So should we start? Sure. Yeah. I don't know how you can, yeah, but I'm happy to start. And, um, so I know I asked you earlier, like you had put on like the big T and the little T, right? And then mm -hmm. also addressing, right? What is a big T trauma? What's a little T trauma? What is trauma, right? Because many times people will. Um, so I wonder if like I can start with just defining what anxiety is, like the difference between anxiety and stress, and then going on to look at like trauma. And if there's questions, I'm more than happy to look at them and answer. Both of us can answer to the best of our ability. Um, Wait, before you start... Yeah. So I forgot to kind of get you to give a little intro about oh. yourself. Oh, okay. Um, in case that people want to hear about you, where you're from, oh, who you I do, am, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. Hi, I just popped onto Insta. Yeah. So hi, my name is Esther Goldstein. Um, a little bit about myself. Okay. Um, this will segue into the conversation. So I don't even remember how we got connected, but I'm grateful. Rachel to have Tuffman. Connected. Oh, okay, Rachel. Rachel's mm -hmm. amazing. She's a darling. Um, uh, she okay. sends us all the best people, so I trust yes. her. Yeah. She's so sweet. She's amazing. So I call her like the Insta Rebbe. Like, you know, when you have like a little Rebbe out there who's like has a whole following. She's mm -hmm. amazing. So a little bit about me. Right. So Esther Goldstein, I have a practice in the five towns of Long Island in Cedarhurst, um, in Long Island, New York. And I would say that I am, um, I have a specialty in trauma. Um, the only reason I pause is because there's always much, so much more to learn. And there's always so much more to evolve. And there's always so much more to learn as a humble traveler, like Yellow, one of the, um, you know, fathers in psychology talks about, like, you can only, you know, take your clients as far as you've traveled. So um, not to, like, make a comparison, but the same way, like, Rabbanim always say that they, you know, kind of are working on themselves. I feel like as a therapist, I'm always learning more. Um, so I especially... Wait, could you just move your head down a, t a tiny drop? Better? Yep. Okay. So I end, yeah, so I specialize in trauma treatment. And the reason I'm happy to give this talk is because what I actually found is that I started working with clients and they weren't actually experiencing symptom relief. And I'm like, wow, what's this actually about? Um, and I started off working with um, more of like people, um, um, uh, I don't like the term, but back then it was called like teens at risk or people struggling with addiction. Um, and basically I was like, well, what's the core of addiction? And addiction doesn't necessarily have to mean like drugs, alcohol, sex. It could even just mean like chronic self-sabotage, um, avoidant behaviors, right? Addictive, unhealthy patterns or ways that we engage in relationships or, you know, um, you know, or that we don't engage things that we're aware that we're avoiding ongoing, um, emotionally being disconnected. So, so like that. So I ended up like, you know, going to look at how can I actually help clients really um, help them because I'm not going to stay in the field long if I'm not helping clients feel better. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up, at, there was a client I was working with at some point in time who um, had like a couple of traumas one after the other. And I was like, I'm going to continue learning about trauma. So I attended a post-grad abroad at Hebrew University and treating complex trauma um, and specifically then to childhood sexual abuse. And then when I came back, so I did a program there, and then um, when I, I always joke that like it was half my old pond, 
um, because it forced me to teach, you know, to learn Hebrew. Wow. There, because they made me do, like, a presentation in Hebrew at the end. Um, oh, my gosh. Really funny. They were like, is it that, you know, we don't know what's happening, or is it that, you know, because I, I, like, had a good accent, but my Hebrew wasn't amazing. Anyway, then I came back, and so trauma has been, honestly, at the core. I, I'm going to give a little information. Not always is it trauma, but trauma is an inspiring field just because it's very treatable. Trauma has really great prognosis when the person gets the right treatment. So, um, so it's just become like my little, you know, study that I've been looking at and really how to help them treat trauma, what is trauma, and give people education about, you know, how to help themselves if they're on this healing journey. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of misconception about what trauma really is because I I've, I've noticed that people will say I don't. I don't have trauma because I, you know, I never got molested as a child or, right. you know, um, so people are very confused when, when a therapist will talk on her say and talk about trauma. Um, so I don't know if we really address that myth. Could you just kind of, yeah, I'm sure that I'm happy to hop in there. So, um, so, right. So, like, if you spoke about the, if I'm just going to go on, like, uh, right on that, in terms of trauma. So, trauma is kind of a word that makes, like, our hair stand up in our body. And it's like, well, what is that? You know, you think about, like, people being in airplane crashes or, um, you know, witnessing a murder or being the recipient of domestic violence, domestic abuse, um, um, you know, going through being in a car accident, being raped, right, being molested or watching someone be molested because a lot of trauma is being in a situation or it's about witnessing a situation where you feel helpless and hopeless and you feel like it's integrity for your um for your life right for your bodily functions um but what they don't talk about is basically the aftermath as well and i'll talk about this in a second to how trauma actually impacts our personality development and um like our patterns responses and the ways that our brain is formatted but so, yeah, so the big traumas that people talk about are the ones, you know, you hear about trauma, you think about like a veteran, you think about someone who's been raped, you think about someone in a, in a specific incident, and those are called big key traumas, okay? So it's kind of like a big boom. Um, and one of the trainings that I'm trained in, we talk about it kind of like as a shock trauma, like there's a boom, there's a shock, right? So it's a shocking event. You know it's called trauma. People know it's called trauma. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when people have that now, um, they might actually not develop PTSD, because if somebody properly gets the right kind of support, has the right kind of treatment, doesn't develop avoidance behaviors, because, you know, the people who don't drink a lot of alcohol or shove away the memories because they're horrified by them, but mm -hmm. are able to say, you know what, I want to do the healing many times don't develop PTSD. Um, and so, and it could sometimes be confusing because, you know, you think every veteran or every person who survived a rape or was molested should have PTSD. So it's not always the case. Now, so that's like a big T trauma. Now, I just want to explain something. So a small T trauma. Now, the thing is the big T traumas and small T traumas could be blended together. And that's where I think it gets confusing, okay? But so small T traumas are more of like this ongoing, um, they're much smaller. I always, I almost describe it as kind of like if a big T trauma is like a big crack or a big boom, small T traumas are kind of like these subtle waves, right? So it's kind of like, if you think about like a droplet of water kind of like on a rock and it just keeps denting and denting and denting, but it's very slow, very subtle. Um, it could be something like socially not having a sense of belonging. It could be like having more of a covert sexual kind of abuse, I would say, is like if there's an unhealthy sexual dynamic in the family of origin, um, people being disrespectful, being socially bullied, um, experiencing a loss, like a loss in the family, um, right, grief. Um, divorce, parents divorce, somebody going through their own divorce, um, family conflict, bullying, right? There can be many different forms of small T traumas. And now I could go on through a whole list. Now, the reason I'm not going to is because the thing that we know about trauma is that it's less about the event and it's more about how the person experienced the event. So, you know, sometimes let's say somebody went to a birthday party at 12 years old and she was so insecure in her skin and in her body um, and she had a best friend that was going to be there um, and she wasn't there. And then people were very mean and mocked her. And that was like the first time that she remembers being shamed socially. And ever since then, she's like panicky and triggered at social events. Now, that could have been ex be experienced as a trauma for someone mm. if right there's this ongoing theme of not belonging. 
right? And you'll see that with someone. So, um, and so, and so that's why it's so important to look at, like, it's much more about how the person experienced the event. Someone could do the grandfather or one person could be like, he was so old anyway, he's in Shemayim, he's so happy because the person was older, right? Based on the developmental age that that child, let's say in the family, um, could understand enough about afterlife to calm themselves down and make sense of the event. But somebody who's younger or had less information could be shocked because they've learned about like people dying and then just stuck in this trauma of the knowledge mm -hmm. that they didn't have. Mm -hmm. So there's so many pieces of like the developmental age the person was at. There's beliefs that we learn as a culture, as a society about certain themes in life, right? People becoming not religious, loss, death, illness, right? Um, so that's, that's the main difference is like, so I would say like the big T trauma is kind of the shock trauma. And then the smaller T traumas are usually what we call actually in somatic language developmental, which means like it's um, in phases of development, something's missing, something's missing in the bedrock and you won't always realize it, right? As you're going through like the phases of life, um, sometimes it will stand out for a child. Like they might feel like they don't belong. They might notice the, you know, the conflict between their parents. They might notice, you know, the, the sick grandmother in the home. They might notice whatever's going on. You know, they might have like a learning disability and that's something that's not, you know, properly addressed. Um, but, or they're seen as the black sheep just because they're spoken or a bit more emotional and everyone's told to like shush their emotions. Mm -hmm. But what I'll see a lot of times with clients is, um, they'll have anxiety and we talk about anxiety, they'll have anxiety as an adult. And it's kind of like, I don't have trauma, but when you start doing the work, there's like, there's a big threat of loss or there's a big threat of, of pain. Um, like never, so, like never enough, like a, like a not being enough type of strand. Yeah. Well, one of the big things that we look at, right. So right, anxiety could, could basic symptoms of anxiety um, just for a second, not before I go into that, because we'll talk about it, just very simply with trauma, there's two basic um, types of trauma. So there's trauma of acts of, co of commission and this trauma called acts of omission. So acts of commission is like things that happen. So kind of, um, you know, something happened. So like someone was being raped, someone was being hit. I was in an accident. So it's like something is being contributed. Trauma of omission is like the trauma of the not having. So not having emotional warmth, not having yeah. um, compliments, okay. not having the soothing, right? So a lot of times clients will have trauma of omission, right? Or grief, um, grief because of like the lack of emotional attunement, right? Um, and they'll be like, well, I didn't have any major trauma. And it's like actually the empty spaces um, that actually is part of the trauma. So there's trauma of commission and trauma of omission. So to what you're saying, right, the not enoughness and those kind of Feeling so red anxiety comes with so many different symptoms. Anxiety could present as, you know, um, um, uncomfortable body sensations, tightened chest, a lot of worry, a lot of negative self beliefs, right? That's what's sitting a lot at the core mm -hmm. of like, I'm not good enough, you know, um, I'm not lovable, I'm not safe, I'm not worthy. It really depends on the personalized theme. Um, and a lot of it comes from like in the brain, if you look at the way that our amygdala and our hippocampus and the emotional part of our brain works, is that it, we really were created to protect ourselves, um, to be able to preserve and live a very long life. So, you know, there's thing called like um, snake or stick. So kind of if you're, you know, in the jungle and there's something on the floor and it's moving around, you're going to run really quickly because you're going to assume it's a snake until you either go close enough or you're far away and you see it's not moving and you're like, oh, it's a stick. Um, but what happens is with our anxious brain is that sometimes our brain fires out. Um, oh my goodness, snake, 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 right? Like danger, 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 run away, run away, right? The fight or flight response mm -hmm. of like, do something or you're not enough, do more or like say more or engage more, or, right? Or the, the freeze, submit or collapse, which I could go into more soon, which is more of like, don't do anything. You're helpless, like run away, pull away. You're in danger. Get out of the situation. Um, but with anxiety, like what sometimes people say is like, um, and, and I do believe in, in, you know, being supportive and saying positive words to yourself. But the pause that I have when somebody says just change your thinking is that it's not a thinking problem. Many times your brain is convinced that you're in danger. And with anxiety, um, sometimes it's important to look at is there actually a core negative belief that even though you're smearing across your mirror in your bedroom, I am enough, you still have this chronic feeling of not enoughness. Mm -hmm. because the adult brain part of you might be like, okay, I'm enough. 
but mm -hmm. there might be layers and layers of parts from years before um, that feel like they weren't enough. And Do you think that, that that's an easy concept for people to understand that, like, I know that that was something that, that I never really understood. And it was like pivotal when I started to understand that. Yeah. So, so how do you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy you're slowing me down on this. So let me hear your question. Cause I, yeah. So the, the part where, um, so, so people are really good at like talking to themselves and giving themselves coaching. Right. But if they're missing something in their core, then maybe they're not really coaching the right things. Right. So how do they know if they're kind of um, d using the same language that they learn from their parents that wasn't working or, or from their teachers or whoever that wasn't working? Um, how do they know when there's like a flag going up that that's actually really hurting them and not helping them? Yeah, I'm so happy you asked this question, right? Because, right, and, and, I, and I'm the first person to be like, I read so many self-help books and then was like actually so frustrated. I'm like, self-help books make me, make me feel worse because I try them and I don't even feel mm -hmm. better. So now right. I'm just hopeless and helpless. I'm like, no, I'm never going to feel better about myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, it takes time. And, and I think, so just to first look at your question, I, I love that you're asking it because to all of us, right, that, and to all of you who basically are saying, I'm trying, right, and I'm, and I'm maybe even in, in therapy and maybe even, you know, um, you know going to different books, or going to different speeches or reading up so much about how to improve. And even also sometimes parenting books or marriage books, like I almost feel like they assume that everybody is like healthy and evolved mm -hmm. and has all, all the supports in the world. And then they just need to learn how to tweak something. Exactly. Um, and it's like, no, let's actually start at the core. So to answer your question, what I would say is like, it's not easy at all. And if there's anyone who's struggling, I would first say like the, the kind of healing, the kind of awareness that you might become aware of as you notice that you have anxiety, right? So the first step is becoming aware that you might have either anxiety in your body. So you're saying, let's say the thought of, I, I'm not enough. So, well, well I, I'll, I'll tell you. So, so, so I used to tell myself, okay, Rebecca, you got this. Come on, get up. You don't have to, you know, don't, you're, you're not lazy. You, you got this. You're not like, but like, and I thought I was giving myself a pep talk where really I was putting myself down. Mm. Uh, you know, like, you know, you learn to talk to yourself and, yeah, yeah. and then I kind of learned like, you know, Rebecca, you're awesome. Like, like I just learned like a different narrative that was a lot more helpful than, uh, stop being lazy. Come on. You know, those kinds of, so, so I think that, that learning a new narrative is, is sometimes, uh, like, I don't know, maybe you can talk more about uh, well i would i would actually go with exactly what you're saying right now because i love what you're sharing and then i'll talk about the different ways that let's say it will come up because not always will somebody realize it's a belief or words so from what you're sharing if this is okay stop me if it's not you're basically saying right if somebody in your somebody told you stop being lazy and it was kind of a push but it wasn't the kind of push where they were like you're amazing. You're incredible. Right. And sometimes we actually don't need to hear that we're incredible. We need to hear like, we're not, we're, per we're imperfect and yeah. we don't feel good and it's okay to cry. And mm -hmm, somebody will sit mm -hmm. with us in our sadness. Yeah. And like, if we're lazy, it's, I don't know that I actually believe in laziness. Yeah. I don't either. Sometimes right. I think sometimes <laughs> it's actually, right. I think sometimes <laughs> it's a form of like, you know, um, like, uh, I don't like calling it depression, but like a sad unprocessed emotion of anger, or, or, you know, lacking skills. Sometimes it could be mm -hmm. actually a physiological, like a medically or like the person's like energy levels down. are not up. Right. Yeah. And then a lot of times it's a defense. Like I actually, the body's unwilling to move, like mm -hmm. until something changes, right? I'm not budging. But coming back to you, it sounds like for you, you actually needed to shift the narrative, although that's kind of what you got programmed as like, this is how people move. Um, you got this, right? Um, actually felt like it was like pushing you in a very uncomfortable way. And it sounds like from what you're sharing that you shifted to something that was a bit more nurturing for you, right? Um, well, I, I learned to tell myself, well, yeah, this situation sucks. Or like, you know, okay. like just to validate my own feelings. Okay. You know, like those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and because yeah. sometimes 
we just kind of try to convince ourselves that that we can handle anything and sometimes the situation just sucks and all we need is is to accept that yeah yeah so you're right you're basically saying that like being able to match more appropriately what's actually going on than what you were told right because many times what happens is and i'll just go like with what you're saying so what happens is that we develop patterned responses and almost like um these um, knee-jerk reactions in our brain so if something happens and you might have an automatic response so let's say for you it might be like come on rebecca right just like kind of you got this giving yourself a pep talk um, and you might feel worse afterwards or just feel like, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm not fully in it. Or maybe you're doing that, but you're almost divorcing yourself from a part of yourself mm -hmm. that really needs to be involved in whatever it is you're engaging in. Because we can all do things, right? But we, I might do things from a very brainy part of me and not from a full heart part of me if yeah. I feel like I needed to intellectualize as a child to make mm -hmm. my parents proud. Um, mm -hmm. So people will sometimes have anxiety back to the question you had. They might not realize, they might say like, I, I think I'm good, but like my stomach rumbles sometimes, or I have like, people will have like IBS. Um, people might feel like very disconnected from the bo their bodies or their or the world around them, which is a form of dissociation. Um, some people might be like overly obsessed with skills and not be present with themselves um, or their children or their partners. Um, people might have like, right, just a lot of worry and kind of like worrying for the next shoe to drop, like having these constant worries. You might even call it a little bit of like OCD, um, which there's a big overlap between actually OCD and trauma because many mm. times trauma, um, the intrusive symptoms are, are basically very similar to OCD when it's trauma related, which many times it is actually, um, many times those symptoms dissipate and resolve once you address the part the part inside that's kind of bringing forward the symptoms. So just to go on the worrying part for a second, um, if someone experienced like uh, mommy and daddy um, fighting all the time and this person felt like if I was just more perfect then or if I was able to, you know, do something to make daddy around me happy, then I would have, you know, saved their marriage. And so this person has this like this um, obsession with trying to control themselves or being perfectionistic, looking a certain way, acting a certain way. So from that need to control, right, or initially themselves, but really the safety in their own homes when they were younger, they might actually develop like thoughts or behaviors. Um, and just staying with your what you're saying, so it might be a 40 year old, but really it's for this like nine year old little girl who's terrified mm -hmm. of what it would mean when mommy and daddy would fight. So when you when you ask that question, sometimes when people are feeling anxious, you know, they're going on a job interview, hanging out with friends, even going to be intimate with our partner. Um, or even just have this overall anxiety, I will sometimes say, like, can you um, just, like, slow down and get curious, like, how young does this insecurity feel? Mm. How old do I feel? I'll sometimes go to the doorpost in my office and say, like, if this, there was a measuring tape at the door, if we, if we just notice that there's a part that's feeling very nervous or jittery or has a big worry, like, how tall or how short would it be? Right? How young do we think? And, and many times people don't have memories from when they were younger. Many times people do, you know? Mm -hmm. Some people might say, like, oh, my God, my 10-year-old self. Like, you know, my brother kind of just verbally was, like, so mean to me because he was angry at my parents or you know, he was being hurt by a neighbor. So they might right away go to, like, oh, my God, my 10-year-old self and burst out crying. Um, you know, or sometimes it's like, I don't know. And then it's like, well, you know, let's get curious because, they, you know, they always say, like, if there's something that has power, it didn't start today. Like right. beliefs that have such intensity have a history. And, and, and although like, I'm, I, I'm like, people will sometimes say, oh, that sounds so Freudian. And like, does it all go back to your childhood? And is this really all about going back to the past? And, you know, clients will sometimes say like, are, do you believe that people need to be in therapy forever? And I'm like, absolutely not. But like, although my whole goal is about, let's look at your right now. So let's say somebody's in their forties and they have this anxiety we can start move, looking at what's actually coming in the way of them living a fulfilling, meaningful, emotionally, spiritually, physical, connected life. Um, but if something kind of if something kind of pops up, and it looks like there's a much deeper theme, I might say like, "Hey, could we dig a little deeper into this? Because we, we need to get to the core and the root of of where this began um, to heal that part, so that we can actually create like I'm so sorry about that. So we can actually create like a shift." um in in the in the brain so i wonder if i can talk a little bit actually about maybe the different methods of treatment 
um, or even about. Yeah, could I just ask you something on that before we move into the methods? Yeah. So do you find that with, with your patients that that when, when there's like the small T traumas that they'll they'll see it pop up in in it could be lots of different areas and it'll kind of manifest in in like similar but different in in different you know, like with with a boss and a parent and a child and you know, the same you you see like the same issues like this yeah. small key traumas throughout right. yes 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 so i'm happy you're asking i like what somebody wrote what's up flower she wrote if it's hysterical it's historical that's the thing right if <laughs> somebody's coming in with hysteria it's historical and has much deeper roots um so thank you for posting that but back to what you're saying yes absolutely so the thing about like the big t trauma or the shock trauma uh, many times is that some i sometimes say like it's not like it's not like we have to find the breadcrumbs of what this what is this connected to it's like there's a big loaf of moldy bread and it's like that's what we're going to go to and this is what we're going to target and like this is how we're going to help you um now many times like i said it could be a big key trauma like someone might have been raped or was in a car accident and as well they had people who were you know emotionally not responsive told them to Shh, don't tell anyone right don't tell daddy don't tell the rabbi don't tell your teacher like you mm -hmm. just need to be behave better right so there could be a blend of like the shock trauma and the developmental piece just to say that because it could be both and they're right. both treatable um i don't want to go into the methods of treatment but there is a way of kind of first um stabilizing the client in that kind of situation to take off the intensity and then work on the developmental piece um but back to what you said yes so the small t traumas like they don't make a big bang it's kind of just more of like these constant waves but they make a very big impact on kind of the development of the personality of the perception of the world and the perception of self. So like you said, right, if a part feels like, um, if a person feels like I'm never good enough or I'm not strong in partnership when their, you know, their husband or wife or whoever says, um, hey, I want to talk to you about something and wants to give criticism, right, um, in, in a humane way, then they might be like, oh my God, I'm not enough. And they start shriveling up and they're like, okay, whatever, whatever you want. Or like, don't you dare attack me. I've done everything, you know, for this family. Um, or with our child, they might notice that either they go to very punitive or right, or the same way, the same thing, or very like suddenly feel very weak and like, oh my goodness, I can't parent, I'm feeling incapable. Um, so I like that you said that. So usually there will be certain themes that will come out um, and it will, it will not come across like trauma. Like, you know, there's certain perfumes, like it's not gonna smell like trauma. It's going to smell like I'm uncomfortable. What's going on with my life? Why can I actually like be my full adult self, right? Maybe at work I'm a certain way or maybe with some of my friends I'm a certain way. Um, but maybe, you know, and then suddenly at different times or with my people in my closer circle, I'm not. Like what's going on? Is that kind of what you're saying? Like it will kind of drop? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I was thinking that maybe just like that you would just notice certain like, let's say that back to the never enough um, idea. So you'll feel like that in different areas of your life. Um, and so it's not just like one issue. So if you if somebody came to you and said, you know, I'm really having a hard time at work, and then you're helping them with work, but then you're discovering that you, they're also feeling that in different areas. And it's only just prevalent in one area. Yes, yes, yes. I like that you asked that. Right. So basically, right. If there is kind of like, if there's kind of like a scrape on my heart, it's going to come across in all areas. Now I might, right. So I might come in and say, in work, I'm feeling a certain way. And then as we start addressing that, then usually, right, if, if, if the, if the therapist or anyone, right. And it has, trauma is trauma informed they're going to get curious and before kind of giving mm -hmm. tools they're going to actually want to look first at that boo-boo right if there's a certain kind of scrape mm -hmm. you want to look like what kind of scrape is it um so right because if you start addressing the work is it the work or is it the heart right and if it's the heart then of course in work you're being triggered and then um and then and then and then although sometimes somebody will come in and say only at work am i having an issue many times you'll see that theme yeah like in a different way it will present in other areas of their life because it's in a, it's in a certain spot and that spot right. is kind of like calling attention right sometimes we'll get into dynamics with people um and it's really the part saying this hot like the boo-boo or the the part that help was kind of holding the pain saying like i really need healing or i, I really need help so um, so if so when that happens and somebody's in your office the they might see that they're getting they feel like they're getting worse before they get better. 
So talking about trauma treatment, right? So I would say for anyone, actually, um, just even in terms of um, anxiety, right? Let's just say even anxiety for a moment. So when you're getting curious about anxiety, so there's cognitive behavioral techniques, which basically really challenge your beliefs and your thoughts and, um, and your behaviors, right? So beliefs are really big. Like at the end of the day, cognition is a big core right here. So let's just talk about that for a second. So the belief, like, because you said I'm not enough, some people's beliefs might be I'm not enough. Um, and beneath that belief or next to that belief might be I'm not safe or I'm not worthy. Mm -hmm. um, or because it could sometimes be like, if I'm not enough, then you kind of stay with that. And it might come up like, you know, wow, so I'm wondering where you learned you're not enough. What does it feel like in your mm -hmm. body to feel like not enough? If you imagined feeling enough, what would enough look like? You know, which how, how young or old would that part of you look like? If there was a part that would approve the enoughness, well, you know, like, mm -hmm. you get clear. And sometimes it's like, well, um, right, like, I'm, well, I'm not worthy of being enough or I'm not worthy of approval. So it could be like, right, I'm responsible, um, like people feeling like they're carrying burdens. So there's a lot of beliefs. So going back to what you're saying, in terms of just basic anxiety and, and coming back to just like the etiology, people can have anxiety, um, um, based on like genetics. So people do have a predisposition. I don't want to say it's always related to trauma. Many times though, like there's a stronger, you know, disposition to it. If there is, you know, certain environmental factors or there's a certain personality, lower distress tolerance, somebody more sensitive. I tell people like, if you have a really deep soul, you know, you're going to, life's going to be harder, but you'll also be able to have a more meaningful life. So, um, so more sensitive sometimes, more emotionally mm -hmm. attuned. Um, but back to what you're saying, yeah, so it basically is going to look like, so you can try to, so you start looking at the core beliefs. Now you could work on like, you know, the thoughts and the feelings, but if you notice that just working with shifting the thoughts and the um, emotions and the behaviors isn't enough, then you look at what's beneath that. So back to your question of, will clients get worse before they get better? For anyone who's in treatment or even is listening in, Right? Even getting knowledge about anxiety or getting knowledge about beliefs or getting knowledge about trauma, right? Um, the small T traumas that might be in your life without feeling like a trauma victim, right? Um, because every single one of us on this planet has gone through trauma. I always tell everyone, like, if you tell me you haven't gone through trauma, then you are not human, you know? Like, have you come mm -hmm. from a different planet? Um, it's just a matter of how it's impacted us. Not everybody needs trauma therapy, you know? Um, right. And also, just do want to say, some people, like, feel fine or have amazing defenses or function very well and they get married and they start kind of like spiraling or they have a child or their child reaches a certain age and suddenly they're having these like emotional flashbacks or emotional triggers or anxiety and they're confused um and it's related to something that happened to them around that age range and it might not be interesting always think. yeah you'll see this with grief people talk about like traumatic grief like if someone lost a parent when they're 13 13 years old, when they become a parent, a parent, right, a mom or dad, they might start feeling very anxious and, and kind of filled with fear. Oh, wow. And, and slash or, um, well, because grief is just ongoing. It's not like, you know, you, you clean something up and then it's like, okay, all done, um, which doesn't mean you need to be doing healing forever, but there needs to be a space of like, getting to know your inner world, who you are, like mm -hmm. you said, kind of speaking more gently, noticing the triggers that come throughout the waves of life. Um, and becoming a more, you know, appropriate kind of vessel for your own self as you move through life. Um, <clears throat> the other thing with grief is that when that person might have a child at 13, right, so they feel like they're working through the grief, a couple of years later, their child's around that age, they might be triggered all over again. Um, so, mm -hmm. and, and so that's why some, I just wrote an article actually about parenting with PTSD, or I would say even parenting with just parenting, right? Or parenting with little T traumas mm -hmm. can be very triggering because sometimes people say like, you know, my child is triggering me or my husband is triggering me or my job, like losing my job is suddenly triggering me. I was okay before then. Um, or my life is amazing. And actually the amazing life is triggering me because I was always in survival and my, and my nervous system doesn't know how to be when things are good. So it's not, oh, wow. always, yeah, you'll find that a lot with people who were in survival, um, or when they don't have to be in survival anymore, right? It's kind of like suddenly they might start having anxiety and they're like, my brain's all confused. Like this, it's supposed to be the other way around. Um, so wow. it's not always, yeah, it's not always so direct. Um, so yeah, sometimes the cause is not always so direct. So with clients, yeah, so back to you, usually the worst, right? Usually even just getting information can feel overwhelming. 
And so to anyone listening to like information about trauma, the little T traumas, right? And, and people might say like, oh, it's just like the 21st century BS. Like everyone thinks mm -hmm. they have trauma. We have to hold everyone with like gentle gloves. Like, oh, just get over it. Um, it's not about that. It's not that we're a weak nation. It's not that we're like sensitive and like not strong and we don't have distress tolerance. It's actually that we have more knowledge a lot of the studies, you know, that have been done in the past 10 to 15 years have been really understanding the brain and the body and people's ability to live longer and have better lives. And really, it's about being um, actually being able to access our own power and knowledge is power. So when I say you might have a little t trauma, it does not mean that you're powerless, if anything, like, because people sometimes say, oh, if you have trauma, then you, it must mean you're not psychologically strong. Be psychologically strong. It's actually the opposite. Many times it's strong people. You have amazing defenses that kicked in. Anxiety is an amazing defense. I always say like, it's like this, this part with like punching bags. That's like, don't beat me up. I'm going to remind you, like you need to be safe. Um, so you're not just kind of flipped on the floor. So I would say like, yeah, even getting information can feel overwhelming. So if you're talking about feeling worse, it's going to feel uncomfortable to even get any awareness of, hmm, like maybe I do have this um this anxiety and maybe it's biological and i always say like first check if there's a medical condition or if you're allergic or if you're allergic to some you know medicine or check your diet and your sleep some of it is just behavioral things you need to shift but if really everything is in sync um and there isn't like a very um right somebody just wrote right this emotion is this generation is healthier because they're able to actually face their emotions and deal with it which i agree with Right? And but also we're exposed to a lot more on, on a much more regular basis. Like when I was younger, I didn't know about all the people beating, like getting beaten yeah. up and, and uh, the murders. And uh, like, I, I mean, I heard about things randomly, but it's like right in people's news feeds today. Yeah, right. Two things, right? There's much more exposure, right? Like my son the other day came home and asked me a question and I was like, oh my God, like how would I answer my own five-year-old self? Like I, right. I was so like, we were much more sheltered. I think there's that. I think there's also more knowledge. So, you know, instead of like, people will say like, oh my goodness, what should we do? Like, yes, it's true. We can all want to live in like a little shtetl. And like, that's totally a fantasy of mine. Like, but the shtetl also had problems, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, how do we empower ourselves at first? Right. And then our children. So it's kind of like, and at the same time, back to what you're saying, we didn't have as much exposure. We also didn't have as much knowledge. I did not know what, mm -hmm. I, I knew what stress was. I did not know what anxiety was when I was younger. What's anxiety? Mm -hmm. Like you're stressed and then you have belly issues or then you look tight all over your face. Mm -hmm. But you know, like. I got back pain. I didn't know I was stressed. Oh, okay. I used to not know that I was like stressed at all. Like I was like, right. no, I'm not stressed. I'm good. I'm good. Right. But I get really bad back pain. And yeah. Then I realized, oh, okay, well, my back pain is actually like stress or anxiety or, you know. Your body's talking to you. My body I, was talking to me. My yeah. brain was not talking to me. Right. Well, because our brain, the thing about it is that, so back to what you were saying and somebody just posted, right, technology has been made much more smaller, um, which is why there is something about, like there is something about back to what I was saying, like if your anxiety, you know, isn't because of situational, right? If somebody watches the news for too much or is seeing too much about like horrible things happening around the world, you're going to develop anxiety. But if you're not doing that, right, because we need to have boundaries, like emotional boundaries, technology boundaries, right, content boundaries. Um, but if all of that's in place and you do have good self-care routines and you still have anxiety, that's where I would say there might be something deeper. Um, and you were saying, could somebody feel worse? Many times people do feel worse only because like, darn, like I can't just give this a band-aid or I can't just continue mm -hmm. telling myself the mantra. So there is like the kind of like the, the, the downer of like, I'm really disappointed. Um, but I always say like, but then it comes with like a, a lessening because like, okay, but then what? There's always something else for us to do. And if you were taking like a ton of Tylenol and it's time for amoxicillin, you're going to feel better. Like, I'm so sorry the Tylenol wasn't working, but like, you know, where you're putting on like bacitracin and it's time for something that has a stronger medical dosage, like, um, where you have to put it on more regularly, you know, then you're going to start feeling relief because um, as soon as you start acknowledging, like, you know, I wonder if this was a small T trauma or if there were certain beliefs that a part of me believed and it's really, I'm really carrying it with me. And everyone says like, drop all the stuff from the past. Okay. But how do I do that? You know, like sometimes mm -hmm. it's like let go of your past, but your body might be holding on to it. 
um, with the anxiety symptoms, right? Mm -hmm. With like fear or worry or the not enoughness. So yeah, sometimes people will feel worse. And the, the psycho ed is really about like knowledge is power, but it's also overwhelming. And I always say like, um, like we have to take like one tiny bite at a time. And sometimes tiny bites need to even be cut into like thinner slivers. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've heard like a, a, quite a few people have, have said to me, I, I'm not going to therapy because um, it, it's too hard and I can't devote the time to it. And it's just opening up wounds and, and, you know, I just can't deal with it. So I'm just gonna, so, so that's yeah, why, I, that's why I asked that question. Um, I'm asking, I'm happy you're asking it. And I do want to say, first of all, many people say like, I can't open it up. So some people say like, they're just not as attuned or they feel like they don't have to. And I don't think everyone should go like do deep digging. I always say like, you don't go digging in the psyche. Like you go with what comes up. Like I, I say like, I'm not a gold digger. I think that clients who come in, we work with the symptoms. Now the thing is, right. Somebody just wrote, you got to feel it to heal it. It's true. And, um, and, and feeling for some people feels like danger. Some people, right, like those people you're talking about, if I am going, if I think about having to do healing, and that means I'm going to have to look at some of the pain, and I grew up in an environment or I never really learned how to tolerate pain or anger. You know, if I think if I'm going to be angry, I'm going to shout, or if I'm going to, you know, access the fear that I had when I was younger, I'm going to shrivel up in fright. Um, then the first step is really just helping the person relearn how to relate to their emotions. You never dive straight into like a trauma or straight into certain things because then because then doing the work could be traumatizing. So I want to just say, first of all, many people, if you can kind of deal with your life with the defenses you have, then okay. Uh, many clients do say like, I had a sense that I would land up on your couch. I just wasn't sure what would be the trigger, you know? Um, usually it's like something going on in someone's marriage, a child starts acting out. Um, something goes on at work like usually there's a part something in life that happens and we're like oh um, and I usually look at it as like there was a part that was like come on it's time to get better mm -hmm. um, but yeah but it gets much worse before it gets better that's just the hard part and I don't know if it gets worse I think it feels worse like this situation I don't know if it if it gets much worse I think um, something happens where they have to start feeling it um, and that's why I would say like, yes, it is scary, but I do want to say like Babette Rothschild, she's one of the, um, she writes, she's written a few books on trauma. She always talks about how good trauma work. You always have to have your feet, one foot on the accelerator and one foot on the brake. And in trauma therapy, I always tell clients like, there's going to be times where we're going to kind of be moving through things. And there's times that we're you're going to say stop, or I'm going to say like, based on the symptoms, like we're really, we're putting our feet on the brake right now. Because trauma is this feeling of feeling overwhelmed, feeling out of control. And in, in therapy, like exactly what you're saying, people are afraid. Like if I go into trauma therapy or if I even go to anxiety therapy or any therapy, are you going to rip my bandaid off? Because I need to function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so really good work says like, look, like we're going to actually like start noticing you and we're going to take one sliver at a time. And I always tell clients like you're the expert on yourself, right? You have a right to come in. I love when clients say like, you know, I had a client actually tell me the other day, um, it was a couple of weeks ago. She was like, I was a little scared to come in today. And I was like, thank you for telling me. Cause I always tell clients in the beginning, there's going to be times that you don't want to come back to therapy. There's going to be times that you're going to get angry at me and please bring that in instead of just mm -hmm. disappearing or because all of the emotions that you've experienced or didn't have permission to experience, they're going to come up in here. Please use me, use me. Right. Um, and so she said, like, we looked at something that I know I called you with months ago that I wanted to look at, but you know what? Like we started doing, like, even though I know we did like a drop it of a, dro a droplet, it was so hard for me. Um, and it's not that her, she was like, it was really uncomfortable. And I was like, thank you for coming back in. And we, and we paced the work and we did like a lot more of containment. Um, and I said, and we did like a whole session on it. Now, a couple of weeks later, she's like, I actually feel like I need to go back to that piece because that's really why I came here. And then we paced like, okay, but let's just check what happens as we even think about looking at that piece. And could we just go to like, you know, the kind of like the layer on the yellow layer, we're not going right for the red. So really, I just want to say to anyone, like as a client, you have a right in any kind of therapy to be like, this is what I want to do work on. Um, 
And what do you do? How do you help your clients? Somebody's asking a question. Okay, I'll answer. Right. So Meira, I would say like the first thing that I do, I'll just answer in terms of any kind of healing, but we're talking about anxiety or the little T or big T traumas is first as a client to know as a human being, I always say like we're all clients and we're all helpers, right? I take from people and I'm giving to people. So even just saying like, you're coming here, you're, you're a consumer and you have a right to say like, this is what I want to work on. I am a little scared of it being too overwhelming or I don't want my anxiety to get worse. Or if it does get worse, what are the tools? How should I manage? Right? So really just having those conversations. So you're informed, you know about like the symptoms you could expect a lot of times education. Like if you have these symptoms, it just means your body is kind of like defrosting certain emotional memories. It's not going to stay like that forever. Right? So I'll give my clients education about how, trauma works or how emotional memories work or how certain symptoms work and how I want to know how they're doing along the way. Right. And that they also always have permission to be like, could we slow down? Um, I will check with clients a few times throughout the session. Like, how are you doing right now? Um, to see how they're doing. But, um, wait, do you have any questions though? I'm wondering, like, do I have questions? Yeah. I'm wondering if just before, cause she like Mira asked about, how I help clients. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about like trauma treatments. Yeah, no, that would be great. That would be great. Okay. So I'm going to say, I'll talk about um, some of the methods that I use, but I'm just going to say across the board, like um, healing trauma um, is, um, is really like, I always say it's like any good kind of healing work is always a blend of science and art because so Meira, so usually it's not just talk therapy. But talk is, um, talk is a conduit of connection. So the methods that I've been trained in, and I think a lot of therapists look, you know, how trained in, or the ones when it comes to kind of trauma, when we're not even aware of the trauma, um, will integrate more than talk therapy. What does that mean? So it might mean like, um, I'll just give some themes. But so science is like knowing the science behind why things are happening, how to change the brain patterns, like we spoke about, or conditioned responses. Art is using a more creative, um, a creative approach and being able to access and to shift the unconscious. So that might look like, and it depends, it's really based by based with clients, but some of the methods for trauma healing, even if it's, if it's one of the small T traumas are, um, I'll use a lot of eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's called EMDR therapy, um, which very simply is a kind of therapy, which, um, will will um, ask you to come up with a certain belief, might help you identify a certain image. The worst part of the image helps you notice the, the somatic, the body sensation that comes up um, and helps your brain process the memory by activating, it's kind of like bilateral stimulation. So the therapist might move their finger from like right to left or have buzzers in the right and the left hand. And it activates the part of the brain that's active in REM sleep to help the brain digest the memory. So even though it might not be like an upsetting, if it could be a memory of mom and dad fighting and you learn like I need to always be in control, um, you'll go with the memory, um, the emotions you felt, the body sensations you feel right now as you think about that memory, you know, the belief of I'm out of control, right? Or I need to be in control, um, you know, the fears along with it. And then what EMDR will basically help the brain because trauma memories and it could be, not even trauma could even just be emotional memories um, that are unconscious, but memories that kind of have a traumatic feel. And this happens with small T traumas as well. Um, get stored. Trauma memories get stored differently than regular memories. Regular memories, like, um, you know, we have like our working memory, things happen throughout the day. And at night, it kind of goes to the filing cabinet into long term memory. Um, memories or experiences, emotional, you know, psychological. So basically, um, what happens is, is that it stays in working memory. It doesn't get stored. And that's where people will have symptoms. Some clients will have flashbacks of an event. Some clients won't have flashbacks of images, right, of, of thoughts, of fears, of avoidance, right, avoidance of certain conversations. Um, they might have more of just, like, uncomfortable sensations. Every time they go down a certain block, they feel like they're going to throw up. Um, so that, so basically, once you, once you help the brain process that into long-term memory, it doesn't take up as much headspace here and the person could be more present in daily life and isn't bogged down with like those thoughts or those beliefs. That's like the Disney movie. Yes, it is like the Disney movie. Go ahead. <laughs> Inside okay. out, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right. You kind of see the emotions, right? Being like, mm -hmm. like processed, right? Mm -hmm. 
Right, right. So, so basically, that's one of the methods. I mean, the Disney movie is like this. I, <laughs> that's what? where they get it from, not from, you know. Not. They're amazing because they use the psychological, mm -hmm. right? They understand the, the psyche. I mean, I think the Disney movie Inside Out also just talks about giving emotion space. Um, because if you give space to emotional expression, like not all clients need to do EMDR. Some clients, my clients hate EMDR. We don't do EMDR. Um, Judith Herman, you know, she wrote Trauma and Recovery. She talks about like how a therapist needs to actually have many methods and modalities because your mm -hmm. client is coming in and there's an empty canvas and they're going to like, kind of dip into different colors. You need to have many different um, colors on your palette to be able to be helpful to them. So I use a different um, therapy method, which is called sensory motor. It's like a somatic, it focuses a lot on the body because it talks about how like, and it doesn't involve touch necessarily, um, but it really helps you get in touch with the body sensations where your body might be storing the trauma memory because what latest research shows is that every cell in our body carries memories and beliefs. And you might, your cellular memory, which is why like someone might be in a situation um, and know exactly how to run really quickly somewhere because their body knew to kind of run. Or someone might be in a situation where their boss is yelling at them and although they're very successful and outspoken, they suddenly freeze and start quivering. Because on a cellular level, if let's say they had someone who once yelled at them and they were terrified and their body froze because they felt like they can't actually protect themselves, the, the cellular memory is gonna kick in. So what we learn a lot is that the brain is hijacked and you have to help a lot of times trauma, even if it's a small key trauma, or emotional memories heal from the body. So, so that's, what does somatic yeah. look like? What, what would you do? So you explained the EMDR and you explained the, um, what was the other one? Yeah, that's bilateral. It's part bilateral, of Bilateral, yeah. So they so all that's use somatic? That's EMDR, although I usually blend EMDR, somatic, a lot of times as well, art. Um, but I'll just explain somatic because they all blend with each other. I mean, different therapists will use the modalities differently, but they all use, right, even the bilateral process. Um, in somatic focus therapy, let's say somatic experiencing or sensory motor, the focus is really about, this is what they say. They say that what happened in the time of either a shock or a developmental trauma, like we said, big or little key traumas, the body basically was in a situation where it needed to have an act of triumph or an act of defense. So either being able to say no or stop or listen to me or I have something to say or pushing away or taking up more space, something physical, something verbal, something emotional needed to happen or running away, getting out of that situation. That couldn't happen, and the body needs to be able to um, kind of, instead of telling the story, the body needs to be able to recreate in some way, and I'll talk to you about that, this situation, um, and have a way to experience kind of an act of triumph, so the part that kind of felt trapped can have a sense of release. It's really like a physical unburdening um, to the Is body. Is that kind of what... Um... Like Brooklyn Moskowitz um, talks about that she does psychodrama. She psychodrama about. does that too. She does it in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, well, you tell me because it's a different kind of therapy technique, but um, it blends a lot of the somatic because it's it's the body, mm -hmm. right? It's like reenacting a certain situation. Yeah, I, I asked her. It was it was kind of um, um, like I asked her if it was similar to like IFS. And she said, yeah, except that you're, you're acting it out instead of. Right. Um, so let's just define actually IFS for people. So just somatic, let me just simply. So what it would look like very simply is let's say, um, let's say there was a situation. And I just want to say also about trauma. It doesn't always have to be that your childhood. You could have had a great childhood and then you're in a relationship. Uh, it could be a best friend. It could be a work situation. Um, good question about generational trauma. It could be a work situation. Um, I'll answer in a second. And that really, really, really like kind of like jab you and your heart and you're feeling insecure and panicky. So it could also be an adult trauma, just to say that it's not always um, childhood trauma. Um, to answer your question, what's a flower? Yes, generational trauma. I mean, this it could be like a separate conversation, but most of the time, not always, most of the time we are carrying um, transgenerational traumas. So if... Um, so I'm going to actually use your question, generational trauma, in the answer that we're talking about right now, let's say somatically. If, if let's say, my grandmother is a Holocaust survivor, right, and she has certain unprocessed grief, or she kind of felt trapped, 
And then she raised her kids in an environment where, you know, the kids couldn't speak up because there was too much, um, um, too much, you know, emotionality. And then the gra grandma couldn't handle it. And then let's say my mom learned, like, there's no space for emotions. I might have learned to shove things down. Now, in my own healing work, right, because she's talking about generational trauma, it might be about kind of healing the pattern of, you know, speaking about the unspeakable, right? And as we do that, many times we're actually unburdening, like, gener we're, we're shifting the generational pattern by healing our own selves and then allowing our children to learn a different pattern because we usually just repeat what we've seen unless we make a conscious mm -hmm. um, choice. So um, somebody just asked a question about TFCBT. Um, that's called Trauma-Focused Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. I'm going to look at that in one second. I just want to finish about the somatic piece. So let's say, for example, very briefly, um, like, I, I wish that I could say no to, let's say, a friend who always, like, you know, stole my homework. I'm going to go very simple for a second. Or somebody was, let's say, molested or um, was, um, was bullied or, you know, needed to be able to say stop. Or needed to be able to feel themselves in that situation where they either froze or they kind of got very frightened. Um, or sometimes they might even started, have started have acting out, kind of like self-harming behaviors suicidal ideation, things like that. It's all based on a part that experienced an emotion that wasn't expressed, right? Symptoms are just symptoms. Um, but very simply, so you, you basically in somatic experiencing, you'll look at a situation, you'll choose a sliver. So like what we said earlier, sometimes you can't go right away with like, let's say a rape situation or um, a child part who couldn't actually speak up. You might go with like a recent incident in your adult life where you couldn't speak up. And then you practice um, a somatic intervention, which has a lot to do with helping the person really notice what's happening in the body. The body starts telling a story, um, like kind of noticing the areas of tension, noticing an area of calm. There's a lot of resourcing before you help the, the person expert, like develop mental, emotional, somatic resources, which is ways to calm the nervous system when it gets very aroused. Um, and then there's actually like then methods that the therapist can help the client do. So kind of sometimes pushing against the wall, pushing against the pillow. Sometimes I'll have clients like stand in place and walk. Um, or we might practice together, like saying the word no, you know, we might do like a boundary exercise. Like I have these like ropes in my room or ribbons um, that will kind of like blend ribbons together and then unblend them. Right. Who are you blended with? What belief are you blended with? Where did you learn it? You know, or we look at like a, a trauma timeline. We might look at like, a timeline of life. So certain beliefs that were picked up that were helpful, beliefs that were picked up when it wasn't helpful. Um, and then some clients kind of want to cut beliefs as we kind of work through the processing, you know, what's true, what's not true. So that's just a lot of like different interventions that could blend a few. Somebody asked about trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So I'm trained in it, but I wouldn't say that I'm the guru on it just because I don't do as much CBT. But trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy talks a lot about um, recreating a narrative, right? So it's not just cognitive behavioral therapy where you're looking at the thoughts, the feelings, and your behaviors. It really has much more of a trauma-informed stance um, where it helps the person um, – um, it definitely incorporates all the pieces of trauma and it will help kind of shift the story because a story of trauma then impacts the person's belief. So someone might have a story and then the beliefs are picked up of um, I'm unsafe or I'm in danger. And so TFCBT really helps shifting that belief from more of a cognitive and a narrative perspective. And with children, I love it. Like I'll use more of the, the children's um, approach than the adult approach because I think that doing our work is very helpful for our unconscious so sometimes drawing out the pictures um of what happened how scary it was what it was like for your body because many times we don't know how things impacted us but our body remembers right and the body will kind of have you have impact. adults do our therapy too yes yeah, so my clients come in and they're like do you work with kids and I'm like I don't work with kids I used to um I but I work with inner children you know clients laugh yeah so I have a lot of like like um, art activities, I have a stand tray. I'll use different figurines. People will sometimes play out a situation in figurines because sometimes things don't have words. Wow. Um, so I, I we think have, that it's we like, have an art therapist. Sorry, we have an art therapist coming on in a few weeks, Siri Shafrin. Okay. Um, so I, I don't remember which week it is. 
So, I but... just want to hear because I think that art, I think different people connect to different things. Some people will do poetry, some people will do art, but I definitely believe that the creative, basically trauma drives out the imagination and the creative part of the brain. Hmm. And the whole thing about what I spoke about with bilateral, the somatic, and we could talk about even TFCBT, any of these methods, the whole point is that colostrum is like the fluid between the, the right and the left part of the prefrontal cortex, which when you're safe and you feel okay, it flows very easily. And that's where, wow. your, that's where your thoughts, yeah, and your emotions are able to be like in your window of tolerance, where you're able to be present, you could have thoughts and feelings and be present in the present moment. Um, but when we go through a trauma, when things were upsetting or overwhelming and we were kind of spaced out or shut down or too much or, right, um, or didn't do the right thing ever. So it kind of like, and we, so that, that dries up a little or a lot. And that's where we start dreaming. That's where hope, I know you label this hope, that's where hope dries out. Like many times in therapy or before mm -hmm. therapy, people are like, I have no hope. Um, and to me, that speaks to the fact that the hopeful part of them has been dried up. But that doesn't mean that it will always be dried up. It means that the creative right part of their brain that creates dreams, that creates, that creates ideas, that could possibly see goals happening has been dried up. And there's a reason it has. But we're all created. Wow. Like our brain is created to replenish itself. Like if you look at the brain. And I just the got the chills. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, that's why I believe in it. Because our brains, like if you look at, it's kind of like, you know, when you get a boo-boo and you like, you kind of like, right, you kind of like lick it because you want it to heal. Our, our bodies are learn, are programmed to health and healing. I always say that to clients, like, we're not going to work, so we're going to work a little hard, but your brain and your body wants it. Like, you're, we're programmed to heal. Like, if you look at, like, plants, you cut down, you cut down, like, a certain branch, um, and then it, it's going to grow right back because in the right environment, if you, if you give it sunlight and you give it water, it's going to grow. And many of us have not been watered properly or we've gotten like someone's leftover water or we didn't get the proper kind of sunlight or we got too much sunlight by overbearing people. Right. Wow. Exactly. So really, I really like simplifying it to say like your brain has and is hungry and has the capacity to heal. We're just going to look at the way um, and the conduit to look at that. So many times clients are like, so talk, you asked about IFS and parts therapy, right? Parts therapy and Brookie had spoken about psychodrama, which is basically that internally, um, we have parts of ourselves and I always talk about this. So it's not that we have like multiple personalities, but kind of just like there's a family structure. We have our own internal families. We have like um, an internal family system. They talk about kind of like protective parts. So we might have like manager parts. We might have exile parts, parts that have emotional feelings or certain trauma memories or just even shame from the past. And then we have like, yeah, protective parts that could be like very extreme, like, obsessing over things, exercising, overeating, um, or kind of under eating, undernourishing, right? So any kind of behavior, self neglect, things like that, bad boundaries. Um, and then there could be like shame, sadness, pain. So those emotions, so we could have parts, we could have a 13 year old part of ourselves, we can have a 90 year old critic, we can have a little kid who's wounded and all alone. But very simply, um, clients will sometimes say, I don't have hope. And I'll say, like, I'm curious where that, you know, when when you learn to, to stop having hope and many times that's the part that just needs attention like and then we hear the mm -hmm. story of like you know when this happened it's like i'm not going to curse on here but like you know like screw hope right but like, right why should i be hopeful anymore and we'll listen to the part of like of course you said screw hope because if you would have been helpful in a really bad situation you would have not been able to survive and your body was like Arr. i don't want to believe in anything anymore so you kind of like you, you, when you, as you work with, let's say those parts, many times they soften and then it, and then over time, because they people, helped you for a time because you start thanking them for helping you back then. Um, mm -hmm. instead of trying to be like, okay, but now, right now you don't have to be there. Like many times in right parts therapy, we look at like you honor the part and you give it space and you allow it a voice. Many times parts don't even want to talk or they're like, I don't believe that you're older or like, yeah, yeah, very nice. Um, but you really start getting to know the parts and as you really give space to parts, because parts just need to be heard, even parts that are kind of suicidal, it's really many times, um, it's not that parts want to die, it's that they want to stop the pain. And they want to take this heroic act of, I want to help you stop hurting so bad. Because I've had clients who like, so it's a protector. Protector, right. And people are like, oh my God, this person's like being suicidal. Or, oh my God, this person's self-destructive. And to me, it usually means they saw really horrible things or they had to deal with really horrible emotions. Um, 
and they just need people to not be so frightened by it. Like you'll have a lot of people misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder or a lot of mood disorders. Um, and I'm not saying that like people should not be doing certain medical regimens, but many times like you look at the parts and they soften. So that's the piece of hope. I never push hope. Like I'll many times like have to hold the hope for a client. I also won't like BS the client. Like I'll be very honest about what I think their healing could look like. Um, but, but many times like I really, I, like I, I will only work with people who I think have hope. And that's actually, I think actually almost everybody on this planet. Um, but I'll say like, I'll hold the hope for you until you can actually like kind of start seeing it yourself. Wow. It's kind of like Alice in Wonderland. I think there's a scene at the end where she says like, what's the path to go or path to, ho to home and, the owl says, like, you know, you click your heels three times. Um, and he basically means, like, it's kind of, like, inside of you. And she's like, why don't you tell me sooner? And he's like, well, because you wouldn't have believed me. So many times, if, if prematurely we tell someone, like, well, the answer is inside of you, they're not going to believe us. And it's like, I always tell clients, like, you have the most amazing answers inside of yourself. I'm going to help you find it. But there's going to be aha moments that you have, either in here or in your life, that nobody's going to be able to give you. It's going to be a compilation of like your rabbis, your therapists, your self-help books, you know, the pain and the pleasure and the joys and the suffering, but everything together. And people find their own unique answers. So anyway, that's about parts and it's some um, therapy can get sloppy or painful or confusing. But I, I always say like, if you, if you have enough space and you feel like the ground is big enough and wide enough and all parts are invited and all emotional expression is invited, like usually symptoms will start reducing and you know people get better um and obviously like they always say with trauma therapy it's not linear like it's not like one two three and a nice ribbon um but there's there's almost often like symptom reduction sometimes there's other some symptoms that come up like one comes down another one pops up and then it's like okay you know then we're going to work with that um some clients just need a couple of sessions and some clients need you know a couple of months or a couple of years but um, but yeah, my goal is always to get clients out of the therapy couch and into like life. Um, mm -hmm. I always tell people like, I want you to like get into your life. Now, sometimes we have to like go inward to do patchwork or to do like real deep healing. Um, but yeah, I want clients to, you know, move on. And I, and I would want that, you know, if I'm seeing someone and I've definitely am a person who like practices what I teach. I've done my own healing. I am always, you know, introspective. Um, even in my own consultation sessions, it's always about like, becoming more evolved so we help people move on like i want people to graduate me you know mm -hmm. i'm like i want you to outgrow me you know um so well a lot of these tools they can carry with them right like that's a lot of it is yeah yeah so good work is that good work is that basically twofold good work is that the first piece is that you're learning skills in therapy to better regulate your emotions. You're, you're, there's a lot of skills building that you're learning. It could even just be skills on like learning how to help the mind and the body learn to calm itself, to regulate itself, know what a trigger is, how to understand triggers better, how to respond better to fear, to anxiety, to panic, to things like that, or work with like obsessive or avoidance behaviors, right? Panic. Um, so you're learning skills. So you're kind of developing a toolkit that's yours and that's yours for life. And you're practicing it more and more. So it kind of is becoming ingrained in you, right? So if you practice things, it's yours. And the second piece is that you're kind of resolving things from the past. So if you kind of, if they don't go away, traumas don't go away or things that cause this anxiety don't go away, but your relationship, your relationship to it changes. So I tell clients, like, it might still be part of your narrative, but it will just be like, oh, that's a chapter. And you know, it's changed mm -hmm. me, but it's just the chapter instead of like, <gasps> you know, or, or your, or it might not even be like that chapter scares you, but you will notice that you have a lot less anxious reactions or responses to things in your life right now. So, right. So good work kind of like it really heals those things from let's say the past and it gives you tools. So when you're wrapping up that healing is done, like you don't have to reheal for years and years and years and years. Some healing might take longer than other healing. Um, but really good healing, like really gets to the core and does that while it's also teaching you skills. So yeah, when you're done therapy and sometimes clients kind of will like be done therapy or have a certain goal and they're done and they take a break and a couple of years later, a different phase of life brings them back in. And, and I say like, it's never that you got, went like backwards, like you're just at a completely different phase and it's a completely different struggle and you're, you know, ready to do deeper work or you want to have a deeper marriage or a deeper connection to life or, you know, or something's changing. So I look at it as kind of like, you know, we're always healing people, but you don't, it's not that therapy needs to be like 
constant and ongoing for people to live wholesome lives. That's awesome. Um, I think there was one question. Let me just see. Yeah. Uh, no, so you, you, you talked about the methods you use in your office, right? Yeah. Um, and singer 0787 said music has always been my escape when I can't express my feelings. Yeah. I love that you said that because that's what we were talking about. There's that, like the science and the art mm -hmm. and sometimes the way in is not through the brain, right? If you're feeling like there's so many emotions many times, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. Sometimes I'll have a client say like, can I play a song? Like, let's say as an EMDR target, or if there's something that they're feeling, they'll play a song, and it really accesses the emotion, the emotion. And that might give them permission to either feel the feeling or actually let me know how they're doing, or they themselves, right, give their own self-validation of how they're doing. And it's, a, and it's a beautiful conduit to kind of, you know, the unconscious um, and to, to giving a sense of relief. Or even sometimes for clients, I'll say, can you make a playlist that's like your resource playlist, like certain music that uplifts you or certain music that lets you um, that lets you cry, you know, that you'll do for like 10, 15 minutes to let yourself cry for a couple of minutes and then, you know, move on to the rest of your day. But giving, I always say like, we need to have a slice for grief, no matter what you've been through, how horrible or not so horrible. Like there's things in our life that we're grieving things, dreams that we had that are not going to come true situations. It could be medical. It could be emotional. It could be financial, you know, it could be things that we've been through. And I always say like, there's a little piece of grief that we need to honor because every human being on this planet has some kind of grief that they're processing. Um, and you could live a, you can live a more meaningful life actually when you honor grief, however it, you know, presents itself. So. Um, on the music topic, I, uh, um, I just wanted to, in case anyone doesn't know, Project Proactive actually has a Spotify account. And we invite people to share mood lists and, you know, uplifting lists with us. Oh. Um, and we're happy to, to add it. Um, right now we have, um, we have a few lists, but we, we'd love to build it. Okay. Um, awesome. I'm happy you're can... saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so most of it is Jewish music that we have on there for different moods. Uh, we have two lists that aren't. Um, but I've been talking to, um, Sarah Dukes is also a therapist, um, and she's a composer. Uh, so she, we've been talking about her creating a list, um, as well. And her music is really, I listen to her music all the time when I need to chill and calm I need down. To, I want to hear it. I believe like oh music is like powerful. Well, I, I, whenever I'm stressed and I put on her music, it just puts, brings me to a new place. So how it's do we just, find her music? What's it called? Uh, so hers, her account is Sarah Dukes Music. Sarah, no, I think on Spotify, she's just Sarah Dukes. On Instagram, she's, she's Sarah Dukes Music. Mm -hmm. um, so she's like an award-winning composer. We've had her um, on on Project Proactive Mental Health Mondays. Before, wow. One of the ones before. Um, she's outstanding. Um, yeah, she talked about create, creative healing, I think. Yes. I mean, um, one of the expressive, there's music therapists that do powerful, amazing work, um, like putting words and emotions. And it does also involve like the, right, the somatic and sensations. But I'm, I want to look, look it up. Yeah, because, she's, she's amazing. Yeah. Well, well it's, it, she, there's no words. There's one song that she, she just did with words. But uh, mostly, it's there's no words, and you oh, it's it. music. It's yeah, it's just wow. piano, and I listen to it when I work, when I when I I just need to refocus, and right. Although this week I haven't been able to. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but hopefully she's going to share some some music soon that inspires her. Okay. And anyone else is invited to also share because I I really think that that's a great vehicle for. For healing. for healing, yeah. I mean, I I do connect also to to music, and I know other people too. Yeah, I've had different like um different playlists at different phases in my life, 
that were amazing. Like, and, and sometimes like going back to, let's say an old iPad, I, I found like an old iPad, like the old fashioned penny one or whatever. Um, and I was looking at like my playlists and I was like, wow, you know, just appreciating mm -hmm. what that music did for me back then and how the music has changed for where I'm at right now. And, um, but I've offered some of the songs that really like comforted me to different people at different phases of their life. And it's like, yeah, it could sometimes, you know, be very healing. Um, um, there, you'll see if you go on Project Proactive Spotify, there's a old school mixtape. So it'll oh, date, really? it'll date me a little bit. So you'll be able to tell how old I am if you. <laughs> yeah. Um. So the fact that I call it old school mixtape, right? Tape and, right. I'm like, you know, how old school is it? Not so old school. I'm not so okay. old school. But um, <laughs> but right. it just brings you to a different time in a different yeah. place. And it really has it really has some great power. Um, yeah. Meira said, "I miss that." Who is that? Sarah Duke's music is she's a a, a pianist, a composer, um, with some very powerful stuff, and she's she's a very inspirational person. Yeah, yeah. I know we have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. I wonder mm -hmm. if like you would want to leave anybody with whoever's going to listen either now or like at a later point is this going to be recorded you like record things on youtube or mm -hmm. okay awesome um nope. would you want to leave them with some pointers or mm -hmm. okay okay would you like me to or do you want to go ahead no i'm not the professional <laughs> you are a professional we no. are the professional role. i'm the professional brain picker okay mm -hmm. um so what i would say is wrapping up is really that because we started off um Oh, my ear was asking if I see men as well. I do. Um, I would say most of my caseload is women, um, but I do see men. It, but um, it really has to be like, whenever it's a client, it has to be like the right fit. So, um, so if you have any questions, you can ask me more directly. And I have like a lot of great referrals for different people um, around the world. And I always tell people like either, I mean, actually people know about this, but I, plan an opening um expanding and i'm looking for the right candidate so if there's any therapist out there i'm just going to put this on here if that's okay so i'm expanding Ooh. just to open a healing center because like we were talking about healing healing one of the things is that healing happens one-on-one -on -one, but healing really also happens in communities that's really what i believe um mm -hmm. so i had this vision which is coming true it's just a matter of with the right people in the right place um but really just creating as well to one-on-one -on -one therapy groups um so anyway, I am looking to hire some therapists who have like an appreciation for trauma informed knowledge, really, you know, um, has some experience and really wants to contribute, you know, somewhere in the five towns or anywhere on Long Island or if somebody wants to travel in. Um, my practice is expanding really just because I want to offer, I want to see people healing with a more communal feeling. I feel like people need to come to therapy and feel like home. Mm -hmm. So in addition to just being their therapist, being able to have groups, if it's art, art groups or you know, um, any other kind of group or music groups or um, other kinds of groups. I don't want to talk too much about my plans, but really just offering a healing center because I, I believe that, I mean, I think that at different, um, at different times, like that's really what people need. So many times people will go like to hospitals or inpatient. And so many times I think they just need more of like a home center as they kind of acclimate, like integrating back into society or, you know, moving through things. And also like, sometimes I almost wish like that clients could meet each other, you know, cause like high functioning, but in a lot of pain, like I'm like, you're normal. And like, mm -hmm. I'm normal and we all have our crazy and you can heal. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'm like, because I always say like we need to build our tribe and so I'm gonna say right now though like everyone if you can find one or two people and it might take some time but people who get it emotionally and could be your support like building your tribe I know for me it has been like priceless just finding those friends mm -hmm. um or you know colleagues but friends and people in my life that really just are my you know rock and it's you know finding mentors or you know spiritually but also emotionally and really just having a support network that really has your back is huge um, because we do heal in communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, in addition to just your therapist, so the therapist can be amazing. I really do believe in the healing power of, of people and love. Um, so anyway, so I would say that's a pointer, right? I think the other piece would be like, if you have anxiety, I would, if you can get curious about what your anxiety is telling you, um, and I know you said you're going to post one or two of my blogs. So I'm happy to put some links. I do put up blogs on a usually weekly basis. Um, really just demystifying, wanting to de-shame because sometimes we'll feel shame. Like, why do I have this anxiety or why am I feeling uncomfortable? Um, 
And basically, it's it's like, could you not shame yourself for your body's having um, a certain communication with you? But can you listen in? Because usually when you listen in, it actually will I like, communicate with you, or it will give you more information, it might intensify. And it's like, ooh, okay. And, and then you start tracking, like, are there certain days that this is worse or certain situations or people? So I would say, like, can you listen to your anxiety and see if it has something to tell you? Um, and I think the other thing is like, um, just the whole piece that we were talking about, like, if you could want, you could look up on the research, like our brains are programmed for health and healing. Um, healing is very possible. You do not need to rip the bandaid off. I would commend anyone who's looking at or even just listening to, um, you know, to, to, to heal in any kind of way for themselves, for their kids, for their partner. Like if they can, if you can look at something inside of yourself that needs healing, I would always say like, even just a tiny shift a sliver of change is really going to go a long way you know so sometimes we'll be overwhelmed and be like there's so much in my life i need to change that will usually get you to feeling kind of like stagnant right and frozen so i usually mm -hmm. take something small even if you only change one small thing okay like turning off your phone for half an hour when you came home or you know like you know i would say like doing like a a 10 minute breathing exercise or even two minute breathing exercise or starting to go for like a five minute walk in the morning or whatever it is, right. You're becoming more aware of something or taking a, a yoga class, which yoga, by the way, for some trauma survivors is helpful for some of them. It's triggering. So we're mm -hmm. taking, because becoming mindful when you're about, when your body is in fear response is either between like hyper aroused, which is very anxious and panicky and hypo aroused, which is like down depressed and numb which is usually people who have trauma, big to your little t is like, you'll find that you fluctuate up and down. Um, going to yoga can actually make their nervous systems like crazy. And that's actually, oh. so people will say, go to yoga. And I know sometimes it's like, yoga just makes them more aware of that panic inside, especially if there was a fear or if there was a worry or an insecurity. Um, so sometimes like yoga is not recommended um, and just practicing to learn how to notice just their body and even just becoming like, oh, this is my arm. Like doing a body-focused exercise might be uh, more helpful. But anyway, doing one small thing will give you a change, even if it's one of the most small things. So I would say to anyone, because we're talking about tips, um, is, yeah, even making one small change. And, and, and if therapy is not right for you right now, you know, like the Pasuk, like in Shema, it says, like, um, I remember not to go old Jewish for a second, but, like, the concept of, like, sometimes – it says, like, why does it say, like, like, why on? And it basically talks about, and I've used, I've used this many times. So basically, it's the theme of, like, if you're not ready to hear, or you're not ready for treatment, or if you're not ready, like, people sometimes will reach out, and then they'll unreach out to me, and I'm like, take your time at the right pace, you know? Or if you want numbers, you know, here. But basically, when you're ready, you're going to seep into the knowledge, or when you're ready, you will be open. But like it's okay. Like if you're listening in, and I was listening, actually thinking, yeah, I was actually thinking of a pasuk too. I was thinking, or was it a pasuk or something? Um, yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. That yeah, yeah, yeah. like to open up. Oh, are you still there for a second? Yeah, I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. Um. To. Because that, because what you were saying is just like one small thing. Because I used to tell myself that all the time when I was younger, um, when I would get overwhelmed with so many things, just like one little thing, don't yeah. get, don't get bob, bogged down with the big things, and and one little thing can open up a bigger thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, I love that you just said that. And just to actually connect it to trauma, they always say like slower is faster. So if you're gonna go slower. Mm -hmm. And you're mindful and you're doing slower work in the long run. You're actually like, you're going to cover a lot more ground and do a lot more healing um, than speeding. Cause speeding is usually like, it's usually not going to offer long-term results. So yeah, small and slower um, is actually. Um, somebody asked a question like a, in the private section. Yeah. Um, what would you say to someone who has had bad experience with therapy? Um, I would say, first of all, I'm so sorry. Can I just say, like, um, 
we've all so I think we've all had that experience of like a bad experience with someone who's supposed to be in a helping experience. And I'm sorry you had that. The research actually is and this is gonna like be heartbreaking, but that usually people will go to like six therapists or try six different treatments until they land or seven actually until they land with the right therapist and my heart breaks because like when and and, and I know because there were times where I reached out for help and it was like just part of why I'm like I need to get knowledge right um being an informed consumer is huge but being able to and you're vulnerable and you need help and the person is not helpful or is kind of telling you you're making progress or is actually harmful I'm sorry I would say it's amazing that you are aware of that and if you are willing to look out for therapy or if you need names, like I'm happy to be a resource or you could be a resource. Mm -hmm. um, and I would probably say if you ever reach out to a therapist, say, I've had really bad experiences mm -hmm. before. And you let that therapist know that because clients come in to me and they say like, this and this was my experience. And it's very important for me to know, A, because I need to know because there might be times where they're extra sensitive and I need to know about that because I'll say like there might be times that you feel like I'm not attuned or that I'm not understanding you, please help me know that. Like, I want to be extra attuned. Or if something happened, I might say like, wow, I want to check in on this. Um, but also because I, it can be a reparative experience for you, whoever's asking the question. You can have a positive experience if you have a healthy trauma-informed, the person who's done their own work and good consultation and really is well-trained. It can be um, a good experience for you to reach out again. And although I know it might be scary and it might be hard, I would probably like go in and just kind of disclose this and say like, I'm not going to trust you for some time, but I need to let you know this. You're going to also let the therapist have an opportunity um, to offer you a reparative experience. And I do need to tell you that they exist because I know some amazing therapists um, who really have seen the pain, but also have helped clients really, really heal. So I would say don't give up on your feeling because it is possible. And I'm sorry you had that experience. Unfortunately, so many people have been in your shoes. Um, sometimes it's because therapists are just not knowledgeable, which is really sad. They'll say like, because trauma is the new hot topic. But many people do not have trauma training. They have trauma knowledge. Just because you know about it doesn't mean you know how to treat it. Um, so sometimes they don't know and sometimes they are not helpful. So I'm, I'm sorry, but people can get helped. Um, but I, I would, I would come in and say like, this is my experience. Maybe even on the phone and say like, you know, how do you work or how would it work so I can make sure this would be a good experience. Like I would say that. When clients ask questions, I always invite them because I'm like, ask away. Like this is, you know, you're going to ask questions along the way because you need to feel comfortable. Um, Rachel Tuffman has on her website an, a blog post about, um, about finding the right therapist and how it's kind of like a dating process. And yes. So Yes. So if anyone wants to check that out, um, if you're in the market for, uh, for a <laughs> therapist. Uh, but um, if you're in the five towns, you got a therapist right here. <laughs> oh, if you have yes. trauma. <laughs> right, right. I'm happy to be a resource, like if me or if like I don't have availability, I definitely have some great colleagues who are wonderful and um, are just able to take really good care of, you know, their clients. Um, and also, I think OK Clarity. Me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also, OK Clarity has a whole database. I know they're growing constantly. Right. Um, and like they're they're not all they're they're mostly in New York and um they're expanding further than you, like I think Chicago, the, like the major cities. But I, I know I spoke to Faye, and and they're really trying to expand their their database. So uh, check there for for yeah. therapists based on what the criteria that you're looking for. Yeah, 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 that's great. I see Singer O seven eight seven wrote. I'm sorry, I, right? You wrote. You went through four. Finally found someone to listen, but she ended up dying while I was seeing her. I'm sorry about that. Um, really sorry. Oh, like that hurts my heart for you. Um, um, so it's, I'm sorry. You know, there's actually something that we do as, as therapists is like, and, and it's in our like informed consent about like in case something happens, it's actually like, I have a professional will. I know this sounds really depressing, but therapists actually do this professional will. I know this sounds really depressing, but therapists actually do this is that if God forbid something were to happen, 
um, therapists are supposed to have a colleague who has access to their, um, like, I have, like, everything online, like, on a HIPAA-compliant database, where basically, if God forbid, something mm. happens to my colleague or to me, that person then has permission and then would follow up with all my clients, and I would do the same for her. That's amazing. So people don't talk enough about it. Whenever I talk, a lot of talk to colleagues about it, they're like, oh, I don't want to think about it. But I'm like, no, this is about client care. And the same way, if God forbid, my therapist dropped dead um, or had like a, an illness that I didn't know about, right? And I do know, I'm sorry about the death. Um, then it's like, I do want to know that I was thought about ahead of time, right? So wow. yeah, there's something called professional wills. And if you're a therapist listening, or if you're becoming a therapist, you should look into it. And it's actually in my informed consent for clients to know. Not that, not that it's happening. Um, and I do think that therapists do need to let their clients know if let's say they have something medical going on, let's say if it will impact their ability to show up. Um, but I think it's about client care. So I'm sorry that your client, that your therapist died on you. Um, yeah, no, great My great phone's question. about yeah. to die. My phone is also about to die. And my, um, my battery for my own self to recharge is like, <laughs> <in the break. laughs>